Why is the Pacific coast burning after a weekend that saw half a million Oregon residents evacuated? And as Donald Trump visits California, why is the West Coast of the United States reliving the nightmare of the 2018 wildfires? Worse, since a record area has been scorched and it's only the start of the dry season. Yes, it's all about global warming and extreme weather, the kind that's cracking the Arctic ice shelf in Greenland, flooding the Sahel where it's rainy season. But it's also about land management. Many blame an explosive cocktail of careless property development and underfunding over decades of public resources. Is the United States able to reverse decades of divestment from land management and better regulate? And just as a climate catastrophe doesn't respect state lines, the same true for national borders. What's the global plan when it comes to trees? What kind of forest do we need? Where and how? Today in the France 24 debate, we're asking why the West Coast is burning. Joining us from San Diego, California, Joaquin Ramirez, president of Tecnosilva and a professor of wildfire technology at the University of Leon in Spain. In a word, tell us what Tecnosilva is. Hi. Um, good morning. Good morning here in the West Coast and in the in the Mendocino area. Uh, can you sound is okay? Loud and clear. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, Tecnosilva is a uh, original Spanish company that uh, we were focused on working on wildland fire and technology, especially on prediction of fires. That they started to work in the U.S. Uh, seven years ago, and right now we're doing wildfire modeling and predictions. And actually we were selected among 103 companies to work for CAL FIRE. And we're supporting uh, CAL FIRE uh, teams and also the federal teams with wildfire prediction and modeling. That's uh, All right, well, basically with a European and a small US team. We'll be asking about your conclusions in a moment. We're also pleased to uh, welcome back to the show Henri Landes, from, uh, who joins us from uh, the uh, Auvergne town of uh, Boissy, that's in the uh, south central part of France. Uh, you teach at the French Political Science Institute, Sciences Po. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Very happy to be here. And uh, I'll say that I'm from San Francisco and I've lived it most of my life in California, so I'm very moved to be on this debate to see what's happening. Yeah, indeed. Uh, we're going to be talking about what's going on uh, right near you. Uh, from, uh, from, from Bonn in Germany, Alexander Held, um, who is with the Resilience Program at the European Forest Institute. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Have a lovely evening. The France 24 debate on Facebook and Twitter. The hashtag is F24Debate. Yeah, uh, what's gone up in smoke is an area larger than the U.S. state of Rhode Island. 35 killed was the toll earlier, but that is expected to rise. 28,000 firefighters looking for a break in the weather. Correspondent Elisa Caverly reports uh, not too far from where Henri Nandes is from uh, in Berry Creek in Northern California. Paul Clement and his family are back in a trailer again. They lost their paradise home two years ago when the campfire ripped through the area. The family relocated to nearby Berry Creek, where earlier this week, tragedy struck again. I thought that driving through the campfire was bad, but this was exceptionally bad. The weather patterns that the fires create themselves was blowing embers and, and the fire across the road. You couldn't see more than 50 feet. You could feel the heat coming through the car. Paul's 16-year-old daughter, Paige, had the added responsibility of getting her animals to safety. You need to focus on something to keep it level-headed, but inside I was about ready to break down. I knew we, there was a chance we weren't going to go back again. That really hurt. Um, even though we went through it before this time around because it happened again, you just think to yourself, really, this just can't be happening. They haven't been able to get back to assess the damage. We had access to the area, so Paul asked us to go and check on his home. So we've arrived at the address that the family gave us to see what was left of their home. And as you can see, the fire took everything. See a little bit of the washing machine. You can see the kitchen in the back there. But there really is nothing left of this home that was burned in the North Complex fires. The only thing remaining are the two Corvettes that were untouched. Emotions run high as Paul and Paige see the photos we brought back for them. You just can't recognize anything. That looks like a washer, but... Mm -hmm. 
After surviving two wildfires in Northern California, the big question is, are they going to stay here? What we're just going to wait and see, but we're taking the process that we're going to stay. And so we're looking at homes right now, but we don't know for sure. We're not going to let negative things in life keep us down. You know, we'll fight for it. And if we want to do something that may go against the grain of what most people would do, we're going to do it. For now, they will continue to take it one day at a time. Henri Landes, your, your reaction to that story, again, it's the second time in three years. Yeah, well, the first thing is uh, to feel empathy and solidarity with the people that are dealing with these fires, this impact on their homes, their impact on their daily life, which is putting a lot of things on hold and making it very difficult for them to get through this. And the second point is that Unfortunately, you are probably going to be looking at such events in this area and throughout the world that are becoming more and more difficult to deal with repeatedly. And that's why we absolutely need to not only learn how to adapt in urgency to these uh, events, but also learn to completely change the way we manage land, homes, infrastructure, our relationship with biodiversity, because biodiversity can, can be an ally here, when I mean that by forests and by healthy forests, for example, and really adapt to these events <clears throat> as fires, but climate change's intensification of these events, to adapt to that, that becomes a crucial policy to adopt now for the next three years and mo longer that we need to have as mainstreamed into our overall economy everywhere. All right, Henri Landes, breaking it down nicely there uh, between two problems. One is the urgent task right now of putting out those fires, and the second one, the, the longer term, the long view. Uh, let, Joaquin uh, uh, Ramirez, let me, let me be, begin with you. When it comes to uh, those fires, and I saw a, a map today. It showed that there are even some of those fires over the border in Nevada. It's not just those three states. So uh, how do you... What do you do when the when the weather is just not cooperating? Wait, wait till you have an opportunity. Be able to be, uh, you know, defensive and help the people, the population. Try to prevent that they are impacted. Uh, try to deal with the safe evacuations, which is a big concern because here in the U.S., people mostly evacuate. They cannot uh, stay in place because of the type of construction, the type of uh, surroundings that they have and also be careful with the safety uh, of the firefighters because to be honest these are monsters we just uh, need to wait till the conditions change because facing this kind of atomic bombs or continuous atomic bombing it's uh, it's, it's not mm. something that you're going to stop you call them atomic bombs uh, and i guess there was a uh, they were ticking bombs when you see that uh, it was California's hottest month of August on record, Joaquin. Your thoughts on how we got to this point? Well, I mean, uh, obviously, uh, the climate in the Earth is, is changing. So it's, uh, we, are, we are seeing that this, 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 the conditions that in southern France, in, in Greece, in Andalusia, they were common. They were common, and we live with the spring, with the spring summers, and and we still are there, right? That's because slowly we've been adapted to those conditions. The changes right now are sudden, are more, uh, are more, go to a faster pace. And what is happening in that area, boreal areas that used to have, you know, the climate, the climate uh, adopted and molded the, the the different ecosystems to a, a certain threshold of a stress. Uh, that is changing, and that little changes makes the conditions ready to burn the incredible amounts of, you know, biomass that we are not using anymore. It's, uh, you know, it's a combination of you know, changing conditions, human presence, and lack of planning. That's and also successful suppression, by the way. We've been here in the U.S., we've been fighting fires for 100 years, so we have been very good at fighting fires, the small ones, uh, when you have fight so you fought so many small fires the next one is ready to burn a ton of land so it's a it's a crazy cocktail 
a crazy cocktail, you say. Uh, let me bring in at, at this point uh, Alexander Held and, and ask you, uh, you. You heard there Joaquin break down a few of the reasons why uh, these fires right now are so massive on the West Coast of the United States. What's your take? Um, I'm, I'm with Joaquin on, on his analysis of the combination of factors. And if you think about that fire research was predicting these situations over decades now. And if you see that, uh, for example, in Australia, in a very, very comparable situation, you have disaster fire after disaster fire every few years. And then in Australia, by now, you had 49 royal commissions investigating the fires and coming up with recommendations and, and anal doing an analysis on the 49 um, recommendations of the Royal Commission in Australia, it all boiled down to land management and fuel load reduction, and very little was implemented. And the same holds true, in a way, for, for California and other places in the world where we observe these disaster fires, that um, we know better, and we know from research, but research doesn't make it to policy, to policy decisions. And we're sitting now on the problem of tremendous fuel load, settlements, infrastructure built into the wildland urban interface, and now the situation is getting worse with climate change. So what, is better, so what does better land management look like? Better land management looks like accepting that you live in a fire-prone country. And if you live in a fire-prone country, or you live like we in Germany, we live in a country that very soon is fire-prone, but California, I mean, is fire-prone since, since um, historic times, um, you have to accept that you have fires. It doesn't mean, and, and this is important, it doesn't mean you have to accept disaster fires, but you have to accept small-scale fires, you have to accept smoky skies, you have to accept Bruce Crab burning like the Native Americans managed the land. It was a, a different land, it was different vegetation structure, different amount of vegetation, and it was burning all the time, pretty much like Southern Africa and Australia, it was burning all the time somewhere, but it, this provided a landscape that was quite resilient against fuel buildup, vegetation buildup, and then disaster fire. And climate change is, of course, emphasizing the situation and is making fire behavior and fire weather worse and creating fierce fire behavior. But the, the, the first ingredient to this disaster is the amount of fuel that is available and the intermix between infrastructure, settlements, power lines, pipelines, you name it, with this very, very flammable environment and a population that doesn't accept to live in a, in a, in a fire-prone country. Uh, Henri Landes, growing up in California, did you accept that you lived in a fire-prone state? I wasn't as exposed to it as the population is today because I moved away from it, um, not <laughs> in flight, but uh, to Europe uh, after uh, university. I did accept that there was vulnerability to Calif in California to high temperatures, which is very linked to the uh, vulnerability to fire, uh, to fires. And this is what um, led me to become very aware of climate change in California. Um, California has a lot of desert. California has also a lot of forest. It also has a lot of elements, as both of our guests were saying, that create these factors for potentially very big fires. And yes, I was completely aware of it and, of course, accepting of it. You can't live today without accepting that nature needs our assistance in being recognized on a daily basis much more widely. We need to recognize that nature needs much more attention from policies. What is usually the intermediary between that, uh, between us and these policies? It's very often science. And that's why I completely agree with Mr. Held on the fact that we're going from research to policy in a very difficult way particularly when you have climate skeptics who make a political argument to not agree with the science, so that makes it even more difficult. The other intermediary is just a general awareness and, and acceptance in our economic behavior as individuals and in our companies and in our 
free time to realize that we're in a situation not just of climate change and of fires that are one of the results or more intense fires. The biodiversity is just disappearing throughout the world. I mean, the WWF came out with a report recently on how we're, we've lost 68% of uh, vertebrates worldwide over it, since 1970. I'm not saying that that's what we're facing right now. It's just that when you have biodiversity that is completely disappearing and degrading, and at the same time, warmer temperatures, we're just slowly but rapidly now eating away at the life support system, which is our ecosystems that allow us to live. And so we've completely forgotten that collectively. And California is not the only place where we need to enhance that awareness of vulnerability to environmental degradation. Now, what lessons can the rest of the planet learn from what's happening right now on the West Coast? We'll be talking about it when we come back, as well as the fact that, well, this is a topic now that's become a campaign issue uh, between the two presidential candidates. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate and we're looking at those record wildfires affecting uh, California, uh, Oregon and Washington. With us from uh, San Diego is Joaquin Ramirez, president of Techno Silva, which uh, is a consultancy that helps track and monitor uh, the outbreaks. Professor of wildfire technology at the University of Leon in Spain. Joining us uh, from the Auvergne region in central France is Henri Landes, who teaches at the French Political Science Institute Sciences Po, uh, California native. Alexander Held, senior ex expert uh, uh, on uh, at the Resilience Program at the European Forest Industry is uh, with us from uh, Germany, from Bonn. And uh, we're pleased to welcome from Sacramento, California, Elisa Caverly, uh, our correspondent uh, who filed that report you saw earlier. Uh, Elisa, uh, you're where Donald Trump uh, is uh, speaking uh, up until last Friday. We hadn't heard much from the U.S. president. Then he started tweeting about it. He's meeting with firefighters in McClellan Park that's uh, uh, near Sacramento. And he was criticized for remaining silent for long. Uh, that has changed, however, and uh, he's got a tack on to why this is all happening. They really haven't. They never had anything like this. But, you know, it is about forest management. Please remember the words. Very simple. Forest management. Please remember. Alicia Caverly, uh, Democrats in California, uh, denouncing what they see as Donald Trump's rake the leaves policy. That's right. They are saying loud and clear climate change. Governor Newsom was in uh, Oroville, which is where the fires uh, were the worst, uh, hit Berry Creek, and he is he was saying it is climate change we cannot forget climate change whereas you see president trump is blaming it entirely on forest management and the state obviously doesn't want to accept this as a as a problem because that would say that the state is doing something wrong but it is a combination of of both things see behind me president trump is about to land and his supporters are out here in great numbers. There are a couple hundred people here waiting for him. He should be landing any moment now to talk to firefighters here in Sacramento to assess the damage, to understand what's going on better on the West Coast, not just California, Oregon, and Washington State. So this is a huge Democrats versus Republican debate here, both sides saying what they believe is the problem, and really it's more than likely a combination of both. And it seems to be almost a question of belief after you visited those areas uh, where, as we saw in that report in Par 1, one family uh, had a, a second house burned in three years, and yet some um, sticking to their guns. Uh, if you're a Republican, you believe one side. If you're a Democrat, you believe another? That's right. Uh, a lot of the people that we talked to, especially that one family that you saw earlier, they lost their house in Paradise two years ago. They lost their house earlier this week in the in the Berry Creek fire, the North Complex fire uh, here just north of us. And they're still d d 
figuring out if they want to stay here. They believe that it is forest management. They believe that they can protect their house by raking the leaves, basically exactly what Trump said. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of the people we talk to up here are denouncing climate change. They don't think that that is the main reason why the fires are getting worse. They believe, as Trump is saying, that it is poor forest management and that if they were to just clean up the forest a little bit, rake all the dead leaves around their property, they could potentially uh, avert or, or this crisis and not have this happen to them. Uh, Alexander Held, in part one of our discussion, uh, you, uh, Henry, and Joaquin, you all agreed that uh, uh, calls were not heeded when it came to uh, land management. So does the president of the United States have a point? It, it is. First of all, you have to say it is a shame that you use these fires now and 40 people lost their lives and thousands lost homes for, for political debates and, and on election talks. But both both um, statements hold some truth. And the truth is not black or white in this circumstance. It is definitely the case, if you look at all the statistics and all the research and all the measurements of temperature rise and everything, it is, it is, there's no debate that climate change is driving extreme fire behavior in more places than ever before. On the other hand, um, you shouldn't use climate change as an excuse of doing nothing and accepting disaster fires as a God-given fate. So in that sense, President Trump, with his raking the forest, also has a point. And instead of blaming each other and, and saying we have two different beliefs, I would say it, it, it should be the way that you say, OK, if we have um, a fire-prone country, if we have fuel built up, and if we have that in a climate change situation, climate change should be the motivation and the driver to do even more and even better land management than without climate change. So it, the direction should go in a totally different, uh, the discussion should go in a, in a totally different direction. Instead of blaming each other, we, we, should, we should really say it, it's both. It's climate change and fuel management, which means forest and land management. And, and this, one should motivate each other and, and not start blaming each other if you think what damage and loss of life we are facing at the moment. Henri Landes, you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if uh, the, the political debate has no place here, the fact is, is that the physical factors for these fires are scientifically ground and there's a scientific explanation and climate change is coming to intensify the fires, just like climate change intensifies other meteorological events yeah. that are vulnerable in certain areas. It's, an, it's just an exacerbating effect. It's something that is going to happen more and more and in a worse way, but that doesn't mean that the fires wouldn't have occurred in general for other reasons. Um, and I think that it's always ludicrous to listen to Donald Trump not want to accept things in science that he believes are economically and or rather politically uh, risky for him to admit he's been doing this his whole mandate. I think if he went to a Republican state with a Republican uh, governor, with Republican majority, and there were forest fires out of control, he would probably say that it was because of an electrical spark from a solar panel that Obama installed himself. So there's he will never accept climate change because he thinks that has... It has it's dangerous for him politically, and he has this uh, absolutely unacceptable uh, stance when it comes to accepting the science. That being said, absolutely every single state, including California, needs to improve how we comprehend the effects of fires and other consequences of climate change and adapt to them. So, All right. So let me ask you, uh, according to uh, your hometown paper, uh, the San Francisco Chronicle, researchers spoke to the Chronicle, uh, Henri, Firefighters in the past may have done too good a job in putting out uh, fires, and that, that's what Alexander Held was talking about when he talked about fuel buildup. Uh, the the uh, researchers saying that today tree density may be too great. Yeah, I'm not. I, we have several good scientists uh, with regards to the ecology of these fires um, on the panel. I'm not going to pronounce myself on 
the relationship between density of forests and fires, because that's not my expertise. I'm more of a political science. So I really appreciate the question, but also the fact that we have on the panel these two experts to talk about that. All right, Joaquin Ramirez, your thoughts. Yeah. Well, uh, I would like to add to the panel uh, another topic which I think is irrelevant here in the West, which is the cultural factor, okay? Uh, the population came to the West of the United States only, I mean, Western population came only about 150 years ago. And this is a blessed land. It's a wonderful land. And they tried to settle in this land anywhere without thinking about natural hazards, what they were exposed to. Uh, well, we, they knew, knew very, very soon about the earthquake in San Francisco. So they changed the build construction uh, code to make houses build uh, resistant to those kind of events. But not about fire. About fire, I mean, as we saw the, the example that Lisa told us, uh, that situation that happened in the West may happen, uh, that happened in Paradise and then happened in Orville may happen again because it can, because it's a blessed land. So culturally, people have to understand the same way that we did in Europe, that you don't build a house in a floodplain because you have a mark in your church that said, okay, this happened 300 years ago, the water was here, right? So we don't do that. We, do, we, we have the problem here is fire. I didn't include that. So to live with fire, you have to do management. And in the political debate, what I will ask the politicians is to put their money where their mouth is, right? So we need more forest management. Okay. Most of the land that is burning here in California right now are national forests, which should be managed by federal grants and federal money. And what is happening with federal money is not going up in forest management. It's going down. So... It's it's a complex problem. It doesn't have simple solutions. The politicians like to have simple answers, and it is not like that. It's a combination of all of them. So we have to introduce management, but we also have to educate city officials, mayors, and city planners that this place is a bad place for uh, flooding, but also it's a bad place for fire. So the fire in 2017 in Santa Rosa, two years after they happened, what happened is that they had better homes and larger homes because of the insurance and because the utility companies paid. So that has to change. We need a cultural change to to think on where we are and we decide we, we decide where we are. And our, our, where to do management. Joaquin, the, the, those those homes that that were rebuilt uh, were they built along uh, stricter fire codes? No. No. Same because. The modeling at the time said that that area wasn't a risk area because the science wasn't saying that that was a risk area, the science that they used to do the development. So unfortunately, they're doing same density, a little less, condi a little less conditions, but instead of a $100,000 home, it's a $1 million home. I mean, certainly Malibu. Malibu has burned four times in the last 100 years. Every time, now we see the houses of the Kardashian building in the same place that has burned four times in 100 years. At least, uh, Caverly, uh, that is a criticism that's been leveled uh, uh, at state officials. And you heard there, Joaquim, describe the, the political hot potato between what's federal land and what's not in these fires. But that uh, more could have be done to uh, enforce stricter rules. That's right. A lot of the time, this is this problem, especially within the state of California, and it is one that officials are aware of. They just aren't, uh, they're, they're not talking about it because California is in the middle of a housing crisis. 20 years ago, the population was about 120 million, and now, I'm, I, now we're up to 140 million. So it's increasing at an exponential rate, and there is a housing crisis. There are not enough places for these people to live, so they're building farther and farther outside closer and closer to forests. And because of this, this is such a crisis, they don't want to necessarily acknowledge this. So yeah, we're talking about climate change versus forest management, but this third issue is a big one that um, we, do need to, we do need to figure out and we do need to start talking about because it's not being discussed at the moment. And it really is going to make a difference. The interesting thing is we, we talked to some people uh, in uh, Berry Creek. And they said that people there know the risks. They know that they have built in a flammable area and they're willing to take that risk anyway, which for people looking from the outside, that seems absolutely ludicrous. Why would you do that? Uh, the, the area is beautiful, but we shouldn't be building in places like that. And that is 
exactly the point, and that is a third uh, issue that we need to bring into this conversation that they haven't even really acknowledged at this point, and hopefully in the future uh, we will start to talk about that as well. All right, so there's fire safety on the one hand, and then, well, there's planting trees on the other. 31% of the world's land surface is forest. That's according to the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization. Now, over the past 30 years, uh, the planet's lost enough trees to cover the entire surface of Libya. But it's not all bad news. The rate of decline has slowed. So there has been reforestation. That decline, though, uh, is now uh, starting... Uh, to slow because, well, that f uh, the rate of forest expansion is slowing. Uh, the, let me ask you, Alexander Held, uh, uh, you know, you were talking in, in part one of our, our conversation about how uh, with uh, global warming, countries like Germany um, could one day be fire risk zones. We certainly saw that in Sweden uh, last summer. Uh, the where we plant trees around the planet, how we plant them, what kind of trees, is that a conversation that's happening? Oh yeah, that, that's happening. And um, while we are discussing from a human perspective of uh, forest development and reforestation and afforestation, um, forest ecosystems are shifting with the shifting climate. So a lot of places that didn't hold and forest couldn't grow there, today slowly becoming forest. So th this is a, a natural movement and it's happening quite fast due to the um, acceleration of climate change. So we're going to see forests in places that traditionally wouldn't be forested places and in other places forests will disappear. So I, this in, in a way is, is, a, is a natural movement of ecosystems. But of course, with, it, with this movement, we see the movement of natural hazards that are related to forests and, and fire is one. And sitting in Germany, um, we're observing quite well what's happening in, in California. You earlier asked about what lessons can be learned from, from California. And um, we're trying to, to formulate these lessons and, and, and learn from um, the firefighting trap, um, investing too much in firefighting and fire suppression and not matching the resources with um, in in land management and fire prevention, um, if you see the change in policy in the U.S. with a cohesive strategy, this is this is a change of policy. This is a lot more using fire, a lot more fire wise communities, and we we try to learn this from from places like Australia, from California, and it is very very interesting to observe our policy makers um, that the research is providing these news and these lessons learned and then you see the behavior of our politicians and they're doing exactly the same mistakes they're investing in fire suppression equipment because it's good public relation so they, they it is it is a very very complex mix of climate change moving ecosystems moving natural disasters natural um, hazards like fire to places that are not used to it and a denial of available knowledge and a denial of lessons learned from places like California for, for other places. And, and this needs a lot of investment and very, very sensitive communication with the help of the media to, to overcome this um, bottleneck of, of how do we make this, uh, this information as a accepted information that is translated into, into knowledge. Well, let me let me bring in let me bring in Henri Landes on this. We're running a little bit short on time. Uh, Henri, earlier you expressed uh, regret that uh, there was the politicization of what's happening in your native uh, California. Uh, perhaps it's a good thing, though. Uh, when you recall uh, four years ago, the three presidential debates, uh, climate change barely got the environment barely got a mention. At least this time around, it's going to be on everyone's radar. Right. Well, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. We need, unfortunately, the human race needs disaster to start talking. Henri Landes, let me ask you. Yeah, no, but it, that's true. You have, because of a disaster, the reaction and a debate that ensues, it becomes opportune to talk about climate because of, unfortunately, the problems that California is going through, and it becomes very acute in people's minds. 
Unfortunately, we don't have that kind of luxury everywhere, and we shouldn't use it. We should be thinking ahead, and that's still what's missing from this debate. Not this debate on France 24, this debate uh, worldwide, this acceptance that we can't just have everything we want in terms of where we live and how we live. We need to start thinking about making adjustments and not also I see the similarity going to live on a coast, on a coastline where there is barely any altitude. I'm talking about a couple of meters and think that the sea level is not going to rise and completely render obsolete living there. That is a reality. And we still don't see that kind of discussion as to how we adapt our civilization in the context of a environment that we've ultimately very profoundly changed. And so the politicization of that is interesting because we debate about it, but we're not really integrating a questioning of how we live in general. I see a lot of debate about how do we invest in renewable energy? How do we invest in energy efficiency? How do we invest in new types of vehicles? But we're not really talking about what is unpopular, which is changing our lifestyles so that we accept a little bit more sobriety, a little bit more rationale through the prism of how do we preserve the environment and live more harmoniously with it. And that's something that we did very humbly. We moved from an area that we thought was too densely populated, which was the Paris region, which we thought was too densely, acutely vulnerable to climate change. And we decided to move into an area that is a little bit more prone to being in contact directly with nature and rebalancing our population. All right. It sounds like uh, uh, there are Trump supporters uh, cheering the arrival of their president. Uh, I want to thank you, Henri Landes, uh, for joining us from uh, the remote uh, southern uh, uh, French uh, town of Boissy in the Auvergne. I want to thank Alicia Caverley for being uh, with us as well. Uh, from uh, San Diego, Joaquin Ramirez, Alexander Held in Bonn. Stay with us. Media Watch is next. And we turn to Catalina Marchant. Uh, you heard uh, this issue is, uh, is rising passions in an election year. Uh, you're saying that uh, rumors, pardon the pun, have been spreading like wildfire? Yes, officials have not only been fighting the fires, Francois, but they've also had to fight the spread of misinformation regarding the origins of the fire. Uh, many groups on social media falsely claiming that anti-fascist or Antifa activists are to blame. As this New York Times article uh, states, uh, the rumors surged when this uh, former Republican candidate for Senate tweeted this, saying that uh, many fires... Uh, uh, Douglas County Sheriff has six Antifa arsonists in custody, many fires in Oregon, stating that uh, they were to blame for the origins of the fire. Uh, the uh, Douglas County uh, off, uh, Sheriff's Office went on to say that 911 dispatchers and professional staff are being overrun with requests for information and inquiries on an untrue rumor, which is this rumor that six Antifa members have been arrested for setting fires in Douglas County, Oregon. Uh, this other, As if the switchboard wasn't busy enough already. Exactly. So they're already receiving uh, many requests regarding uh, these rumors. Uh, this uh, Jackson County Sheriff Office also saying to please verify your information and sources and please do not spread rumors. Uh, the FBI, on a larger scale, also said that they've been uh, uh, they've been analyzing these reports, saying that these uh, are untrue rumors. Uh, this is not the first time that this has been happening. Uh, as you can remember, this video of a 75-year-old protester, uh, he was shoved by the police. Uh, so these rumors of Antifa groups have been spreading since June when Donald Trump said that he was an Antifa provocateur. So it definitely have to keep a lookout when it comes to false news on the web, Francois. All right, particularly in, in, in a situation like this where rescuers are uh, already overwhelmed uh, yeah. at times. Uh, 20, the focus has yeah. to be on the wildfires, indeed. Camilla Marchant, uh, Catalina <laughs> Marchant, excuse me. Uh, many thanks. Uh, don't want to spread misinformation about your, your, yeah, your we first name. We have, uh, we thank, want to thank you for joining us here in the France 24 debate. <laughs> 